بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا أبا عبد الله ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويطعمون الطعام على حبه مسكينا ويتيما واسيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم The religion of Islam is not just a religion that's a theoretical religion it is also a religion that is practical as in when the words of Allah were revealed in the Holy Quran about a certain custom or a certain tradition that was taking place in society it was not only the words of Allah that asked the people to change but the actions of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as well as those around him. Therefore, the religion of Islam not only is a theoretical one, but also one that is practical. An example of this, for example, in the Holy Quran, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allah atqaakum. This was revealed to tell the people in that society that there is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab. There is no difference between a person with a dark skin or a person with a lighter skin. It doesn't matter which nation you're from. In the eyes of Allah, the best of you is the one that has the most taqwa. This is the theoretical part of this verse. Then you have the practical part. What's the practical part that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam His part in this is when you read the life of the Holy Prophet. Most of the times the people that are surrounding themselves around the Holy Prophet are people from different nations, people from different skin color. The likes of Bilal, the likes of Khabbab, Ammar ibn Yasir are surrounding the Holy Prophet. Not necessarily are they from the upper class Arabs or they are from Quraysh or they are from a rich family. You will notice different types of people are around the Holy Prophet. And the Holy Prophet made sure that those around him, it does not matter where they are from as long as they want to be around him. And this was one of the reasons Quraysh, they came to Rasulullah. They said, Oh, Muhammad, we... We like the words that you are reciting. These verses from the Quran that you are reciting, we enjoy listening to them. But we do not want to come and sit next to you because you've got people that are not from our class. They are not from our standards. They are not people that we want to be seen around. Sadly, this is also sometimes the occasions in this uh, day and age. Sometimes you will notice that people will not want to mix with people that they see they are from lower class. They say, I am from this family or I have this much money in my bank account. I drive this car. I don't want to be seen with someone that's got a normal job. This was the problem that the Holy Prophet faced even in Medina. In Medina, for example, some of the companions, they would not come for Salat Jama'ah. 
It would not seen, be seen in the Prophet's mosque. And when they would be asked, why don't you come for the salah? Why don't you come pray behind Rasulullah? They would respond by saying, the people that are there are not from my class. They're not from my type. So I'd rather not stand, not mix with people that are not with, from my type. Rub shoulders with people that are I see in my eyes as lower class. So the Quran and the religion of Islam in particular did not come only theoretically to change people, not only the words of Allah. The Holy Prophet also tried to change this. The Ahlul Bayt also, anything they, anything they saw was against the religion of Islam. Even if it was culture, if it was custom, they would speak out against this. If you look at, for example, from the 6th, 7th, 8th Imam, all the way up, in the, up until the 11th Imam, the Imams did not get, get married from women, for example, that are from their same tribe or their same city. You'll notice that they married women from Africa. They married women from different nations because they did not see people as nationalities. They saw them as through their taqwa, through their deeds. Therefore, we take the Ahlul Bayt as the door to the message of Islam. We don't want to take our religion from those that stood against Rasulullah. Let me give you some examples before we go to the door of Fatima Salamullahi alayha. We look at the Quran in Surah at tawbah Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولِ إِذَنْ لِي وَلَا تَفْتِنِّي From them is them that say, Allow me permission. Do not let me fall into fitna, into trial. Allah says, Ala fil fitnati saqatu. They have already fallen into this fitna. Surah at tawbah Surah 9. What's this about? This is about the incident of Tabuk. Before the incident of Tabuk, Rasulullah, he called upon the Muslims to get ready to fight against the Romans. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Allah says in the Holy Quran, O oh you who believe, it's not addressing kuffar or mushrikeen or Ya ayyuhal ladheena amen. O you who believe, why is it when you are called fi sabilillah, in the way of Allah, you become heavy in your action? The expression here, heavy is a animated expression as if they started to make excuses not to join rasulullah some of them would say oh rasulullah it is summer now it's too hot for us to go to fight others would say oh rasulullah it's now time for our crops to grow we don't want to leave our crops and our farming Others would say, Oh Rasulullah, how can you take us towards the Romans and we leave our wives and our children and our families behind? And then there was one, Jid ibn Qais, who says to Rasulullah, Give me permission. Do not let me fall into trial. What's his excuse? He tells Rasulullah that, Oh Rasulullah, if I go to fight against the Romans and I go towards their areas i might see their women and i might fall for them because they are beautiful women so i might fall for them and i will fall into sin i will fall into trial allah tells him you've already fallen into fitna you've already befallen yourself into sin by disobeying the holy prophet you know sometimes you have people they don't like to spend money on themselves, on their family. They keep their money in their account. They keep their money in their pocket. They don't like to spend even on their family. And you ask them, why don't you spend on your family? They say, Wallah, if I spend on my family, I might become poor. Oh, well, he's already living a poor life. Yet what? He doesn't want to fall into it. He makes an excuse. The same example falls here. This companion, He's already fallen into trial, into sin. Yet he tells Rasulullah, allow me, give me permission. I don't want to fall into 
this type of fitna. This is the example of some people that the Holy Prophet had to deal with. Again, Surah At-Tawbah gives us another example. Those that promised Allah that if He gives us from His fadl, from His goods, from His rewards, what do they do, these people? This is about a companion by the name of Tha'laba who went to Rasulullah. He said, Oh Rasulullah, I am poor. Make dua for me that I may be granted some wealth. Of course, we know that if Rasulullah makes a dua, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he raises his hands in dua, his dua is what? Is answered. So Rasulullah tells him, Tha'laba, why don't you live like me? One day I have food to eat and I thank and praise Allah. And one day I'm without food and I still thank and praise Allah. قليلاً, and he tells him, قليلاً تؤدي شكرا خير من كثيرا لا تطيقا. This little that you have that you can thank for, be gratitude, give gratitude for, is better than having a lot you cannot give gratitude for. Tha'laba says, no, Rasulullah, make dua for me. Rasulullah raises his hands and makes dua for Tha'laba to gain some wealth. And of course, the Quran tells us, فَلَمَّا آتَاهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ بَخَلُوا بِهِ وَتَوَلَّوا وَهُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ This is also a companion of Rasulullah. Tha'laba, after Rasulullah made dua for him to gain money, before you know it, Tha'laba became rich. He stopped attending the Prophet's mosque and then Rasulullah sent one of his workers to go to Tha'laba to ask him to pay zakat. When the verse was revealed that zakat becomes wajib, they went to Tha'laba. Tha'laba did not want to pay the zakat. His, his response was, I feel this is like jizya. I don't want to pay the zakat. News reached Rasulullah in which he said, when, as soon as he heard this, he said, Ya wayla tha'laba, Ya wayla tha'laba. He repeated this three times. These are people, not only did they dis disobey Rasulullah, they also gained from him. Because some, some people in Medina, or even sometimes after the Fatah of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, they became Muslim. Why? Because they saw that there was worldly rewards from this that they could gain from this life by becoming a Muslim. The likes of Abu Sufyan and this type, they did not become Muslim because they believed in it. Their hearts believed in it. No, they thought it's either that or we're going to face issues and problems in this life. So I'll become a Muslim. Again, others were like this. Abi Abdullah al Hussein famously says, Al-Nas Abid al-Dunya wal-Deen la'akun ala al sinatihim People are what? Are the slaves of this world. And religion is what? Is something that play, plays on their tongues. And then when the going gets tough, when it becomes difficult, there's only a handful that actually stand up and show themselves and not shy away from sacrificing. Now let's go to those that sacrifice. Those that gave for the religion. Let's look at before the Hijrah, Rasulullah comes to Amir al muminin He tells him that Quraysh, that Jibra'il has informed me, Quraysh planned to kill me while I am in my house. And I have been ordered to migrate to Medina, to Yathrib then. And I want you to stay in my place. Imam Ali responds by saying, Oh Rasulullah, if I stay in your place, will you be safe? Will you be okay, O oh Prophet of Allah? The Prophet responds by saying, yes, I will be safe. Amir al-Mu'mineen responds, Ruhi li ruhika al fida ya Rasulullah. I will take your place. And he goes and takes the Prophet's place and he sleeps in his place. And the verse is revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ اِبْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ This is one of the merits of someone that gave not to gain in this world. Amir al-Mu'mineen did not tell Rasulullah, will I be safe if I stay in your place? Will I be okay? What will I gain from staying in your place? He said, Oh Rasulullah, will you be safe? He gave for no return in this world. Let's look at another example. 
his beloved wife Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam on the day of her wedding. Someone comes knocking on the door. They say, Oh Fatima, I am someone that is poor and I don't have clothes to wear even. That the clothes that I am wearing are ripped. They're not in even in a good condition for me to wear them. And Fatima takes her wedding dress and she gives it to this poor woman. And Rasulullah finds out about this. And he tells her, oh Fatima, why did you give your new dress away? Why did you not give something old or something else? And she responds by saying, oh Father, oh Rasulullah, I heard from your mouth that Allah says, that you have to give something that you love out of your love. Allah doesn't want spare change. You know, sometimes you have these boxes you put sadaqah in. What do you end up doing? When you have change, loose change, you don't want to keep it in your pocket, you put it in sadaqah. Allah doesn't want spare change. Allah wants from that that you love. Something that you love yourself, you give out in charity. On her wedding day, she gave her dress away. That's the example of the house that was giving. The example of the house that not only gave for the sake of Allah, but did not want in return. We give for the sake of Allah. We don't want a reward in this life. I started tonight's lecture with the verse of Surah Al-Insan The story goes that Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein fell sick, they were ill and they were told that make a nidr, an oath that if Hassan and Hussein become better that you fast for three days So Imam Ali alayhi salam, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and Fidda also with them they decide that they will fast three days when their oath is fulfilled. And it is, of course. In another narration, we are told Hassan and Hussein also fasted with Amir al muminin Fatima al Zahra, alayhum as salam, and Fidda. They also fasted. So they fast the first day and they are about to break their fast, and there is a knock on the door. It's Ya Ala Bayti Muhammad, Ya Ala Rasulullah. I am a miskin. Give me some food to eat and I will make dua that you get reward in the hereafter. So without even thinking, they take the iftar they are about to have and they give it to this miskin, this needy person. And they slept with drinking water only by breaking their fast with water. The second day, an orphan comes knocking on the door and asking again the same thing, that I am an orphan. And again, they give their food away and they break their fast with water. The third day, the same thing. It's an asir, a prisoner that comes knocking on the door and says, I am a prisoner, a captive, and I have no food. Give me some food. And again, they give him food. We are told that on the fourth day, Amir al muminin takes Hassan and Hussein alayhum salam to the Prophet and the Prophet sees that they are shivering, shaking from the hunger that they are feeling. He takes them, he goes to the house of Ali and Fatima and he notices that Fatima alayhi salam is also very weak. When he sees this, Jibra'il ascends and recites to him these verses in al from verse 5 till verse 18 in which the verse where يطعمون الطعام is mentioned in it. And they gave out not for something in return. See, sometimes someone would give for return. Someone would give so they put their name on top of the place that he's given to. Or they announce in front of everyone that this Mr. X has given this much money. Mr. Y has donated this much money. Put my name on every wall on the entrance of every place put my photo some people give for that that's why we have a narration that on the day of judgment Allah will tell this person that gave he will tell him that you received your reward 
in this life. I will not give you a reward in the next life. Your reward, the, what, what you asked for, was in this world. But there are others that would give for the sake of Allah. They don't want gratitude in this world. They don't want reward in this world. And subhanallah, there's a question that is raised. Why is this miskeen, this needy person, this yatim, this orphan, and this asir, this captive, why do they come to the house of Ali and Fatima? Because they're in Medina. First of all, some people argue, they say, this ver these verses is not about Ali and Fatima. It's about other people. Because this surah, Surah Al-Insan, is a Mecca surah. It's not a Madani surah. You know, they just want to remove any merit, any fadila from Imam Ali. First of all, we say Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein were born in Medina. So it can't be uh, a Mecca surah. Secondly, an Asir. There was no Asir. There was no captive in Mecca. Because the Muslims did not participate in any battles. The Asir must have been where? In Medina, when they actually partook in battles. And subhanAllah, another point to mention, that usually when Allah speaks about gratitude in the hereafter, He mentions, he mentions Hurul Ain. Whenever He speaks about Jannah and the fruits of Jannah, and whatever you reward you get from Jannah, Allah mentions Hurul Ain. In these verses, Allah does not mention Hur al Ain. Why? In respect for Fatima al Zahra. So, this miskeen, this yateen, this asir, why do they come knocking on the door of Ali and Fatima? Why don't they go knocking on any other door? They've come to the city of Medina. Why is it that they go to that door? Do you know why this miskeen, this needy person, this orphan, this asir, this captive, they also had some wisdom. Why? Because they knew the only door that they would go knocking on that would not turn them away is the door of Ali and Fatima. They knew when they come knocking on that door, they will get something. Any other door you might not gain. That door of Fatima is that door of giving. That door of Fatima alayhi salam, when she entered that door with her husband Amir al-Mu'mineen, she entered and her dowry was the shield of Imam Ali alayhi salam. When Rasulullah tells Amir al-Mu'mineen when he's come to propose to Fatima, tells him, what's your dowry? What do you have to give to Fatima? He tells him, oh Rasulullah, I have a suit and a horse and a shield. That's all I have in my name. Things have changed now. They tell you how many zeros you have in your bank accounts. What's your job? What's your degree? How much money you earn when you go to propose? Alhamdulillah. So Amir al muminin says, I've got these three things. Rasulullah tells him, you need your sword to, for jihad. Your sword is important to Islam. And you need your horse as well for your job as a farmer. But your shield you do not need. Go and sell your shield and bring the money as dowry. Scholars say that the shield was sold for 480 dirhams and that was the dowry of Fatima. She entered that door with this small amount of dowry. And she lived such a difficult life that sometimes Rasulullah would come and he would see that she is in pain because she is what? Grinding the barley and the wheat. And he would look at Fatima and he would tell her, تَعَجَّلِي مَرَارَةَ الدُّنْيَا لِحَلَاوَةِ الْآخَرَ أو Fatima. Bear the bitterness of this life for the sweetness of the hereafter and she lived and she told Amir al muminin oh Ali everything in the house I will look after and Amir al muminin said everything outside the house I will look after Rasulullah also mentioned to Fatima when she got married do not ask Amir al muminin for anything if he gives you something take it but do not ask for him for anything and she does not ask him for anything. That same door of Fatima is that door that Rasulullah would stand next to and say, Babu Fatima Babi. This door of Fatima is my door. That's why tonight, and it's the last night of our majalis, 
We, as the followers of Fatima, we want to knock on the door of Fatima. We want to say, Oh Fatima, Ya wajihatan indallah, ishfa'ilana indallah. With your hajat, go to Fatima tonight. I mentioned this very famous story mentioned in a book titled Karamat al Zahra. A Sayyid al Abtahi mentions that around 50 or 60 years ago, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Hadi al Milani was in Mashhad. This is mentioned in this book, was in Mashhad. And a German family came to him, a German man and a German woman. They came to him and they said, you are the marja and we want to become Muslims. We want to do the shahada in Mashhad here in, near the shrine of Imam al-Rada and become Muslim. Sayyid Hadi al-Milani, Ayatollah al Sayyid Sayyidah al-Milani said to them, very well, no problem. But tell me, why do you want to become Muslims? You are German, you are from a different place. They said to him that around a few years ago, we have one daughter, only one daughter. She's young, she's around 16, 17 at the time. She's everything in our life. One day, as she was coming down the stairs, she fell and she broke her ribs. She fell off the stairs and she broke it. We went to every doctor, we went to every hospital, and they said that your daughter will be paralyzed and she will stay in bed and you say your farewell, she will die soon. They said, we tried everything, every medicine, every doctor, until we had a maid, an Iranian maid that used to clean the house. She came to us and said, I've got a way for your daughter to be cured. They said, how? She said, we have a personality in our religion. Her ribs were also broken. She was also very young. Pray towards your Lord through her. Pray to Allah through this woman. And probably your daughter will be cured. But on one condition. They said, what's that condition? She said to them, if your daughter is cured, you become Muslim. They said, every day we would sit next to this Iranian woman and raise our hands to God. And she would say some words and we would respond to her. We would say the same words. Ayatollah said, what were these words? They said, she would raise her hands and she would say, Ya Fatima Aghithini. She said, every day we made this dua, every day we raised our hands and we said, Ya Fatima Aghithini, until one day, as we were making this dua, my daughter stood up and came towards us. We looked at her and we said, how did you stand up? She said, while I was lying there, a woman came to me. This is mentioned, as I mentioned, in Karamat al-Zahra, a book called Karamat al-Zahra. You can check the reference. A woman came to me and she wiped her hands on my chest. And she said, I also have broken ribs. I also have broken ribs. But your family, they made dua. They made dua to, Lord, to Allah through me and you will be cured. And we, after this, they became Muslims underneath the hand of Grand Ayatollah. Sayyid Hadi Milani. So tonight, go knocking on the door of Fatima, salamullahi alayha. That same door after the demise of Rasulullah by a few days. The second with a group of men came towards the door and they called that Ali comes out the house. Fatima would go towards the door and she would say, do you not know that this is the house of Rasulullah's daughter? Did you not hear that Rasulullah used to say that the door of Fatima is my door? The second would say, I will burn the house and whoever is in it. They would tell him, but Fatima is in the house. He would say, so what? And they would break into the house. When they push the door open, Fatima in her honor, she would hide behind the door, protecting her hijab as she hid behind the door. 
ذا العين كيكت ذا دور انتو فاطمة ذن هي سكويز ذا دور انتو ها ستارتد بوشينغ هادا هي همسالف سايز When I noticed that Fatima was behind the door, I started to push harder and harder, squeezing her. I would hear her cry. Then I noticed that there was a nail in the door. I made sure that nail pierced the chest of Fatima until she miscarried Mohsin. She would cry out, Oh, Father, come towards me, for I have miscarried my son Muhsin. Ya Rabb al Hussein, Bihak al Hussein, Ishfi Sadr al Hussein. إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات وأموات الحاضرين والسامعين وإلى أموات مؤسسين هذا المجلس وبالأخص السيد ميثم الموسوي نقرأ لهم جميعا ثواب صورة الفاتحة تسبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد